as you know, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Yay. Hey, there you go. He is awesome, as we talked about last week. Um, this week is stacked. Why have I stacked it way too full? Very simply, next week we're doing the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the week after that we're doing the gifts with a little bit of time to answer any other questions that come up. So please uh, be aware we're going to hammer through some stuff, I'm going to share some uh, scriptures clearly, but there's a lot of material there for you as well. Please don't get overwhelmed by any of the charts or anything like that, we're going to go through those together. So even more glorious, we know we are in the Holy Spirit's ministry, which they, the Bible says is even more glorious than anything else. And so that's the top of the idea. Receiving, boiling, and being full of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that. We're also going to cover off two of the key questions that I was given in your notes ahead of time when I asked you what you wanted to know. You wanted to know, can we lose the Holy Spirit? And some people also wanted to know about Holy Spirit baptism. So we're going to cover all that off today in 35 minutes. Okay. <laughs> then we're going to go on and do the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, let's hope it's reasonably clear. So, that's what we covered last week. That's what the notes cover, we've got some extra reading scriptures in there, why he matters, what gets in the way, how many spirits are there, there's one spirit but there are three other types of spirits in the creation, uh, we talked about what's in his name, we've got a whole list of all his names, uh, at least 33 of them, who is he, is he real, Can we, does he feel stuff, we talked about what he does for the lost, the church and for the Christian and we talked about what we're going to cover this week, so here we go. I have to be right the way over here. Um, I had a, a, an experience with uh, the Holy Spirit before I was a Christian. I was uh, seeking God in my heart. I went to Bath Abbey. I was driving around the country with a girl. We weren't married. Um, but we were driving around anyway. Uh, and we were uh, going around the place. And she was a Catholic, so she was off praying in the Abbey because it was beautiful. I was looking at the architecture. I thought it was pretty cool. I uh, looked, bought some books, turned out quite helpful in the end, and I thought, I'll tell you what, while she's still doing her thing, I'm going to go outside, and uh, I've shared this with some of you already, I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to uh, just have a look around, it's a beautiful sunny day. So I walked out of Bath Abbey, there's a big wooden door, if anyone's been there, I'm walking out, I stopped, have you ever felt like someone's too close to you behind you? You can't see them, but you know they're there. So I stopped, and I thought, who's that? No one was there. But what did start to happen, as I stood outside Bath Abbey, I started to feel a pressure in my feet. Like something was being poured into me. And it was coming up my legs, and it came up past my calves and my thighs. When it hits your thighs and you're feeling this distinct line of pressure coming up your body, you think, wow, this is, this is strange. What is this? And it came up through my torso, hit my head, boom, <coughs> this is Jesus. I have been called today to become a minister, I'm going to resign from the army, and I will be honest with my girlfriend, who wasn't the woman I was driving with. So I did all those three things. I walked away, I was singing about Jesus, couldn't stop myself singing about Jesus, I was reading the Bible, I felt so resentful that I was doing things other than spending time with Jesus. And then, that carried on for quite a while, I started going to church etc, etc, came up to London, happened to go to a party, there was a disciple at the party, she said, hey, you ever go to church? I said, yeah, yeah I do, it's great, she said, come to our church, and a good friend, the only guy I'd ever got on with at university, we chuckled after the Graf, and he said, oh man, you should see this church up in London, man, they put like five pound notes in the contribution, <laughs> that's the one thing I remember, and he said, that's the church. <laughs> Committed, I'll do that. This was when five pounds was a lot of money. <laughs> anyway, so I went, uh, went to church, studied the Bible. First day, they took me down to Speaker's Corner and we started, they started to preach the word. I was like so fired up. I said, do you want to have a go? I said, not just yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we started studying the Bible. Went along to a midweek. We stu they were studying the book of Acts. They started in Acts 2. I don't know if it was special for me. I suspect God had a plan. I went up to them after my first week. You've got to baptize me. It's incredibly clear what the Bible teaches. You've got to baptize me. You've got to baptize me now. And they were like, we can't. I said, why? You haven't studied enough. Well, get on with it. 
<laughs> Literally, it was like, come on, I can die any moment. Mm. And so we studied the Bible through, and uh, within two weeks I got baptized. But the point I'm trying to make is, the Holy Spirit is an extraordinary thing mm. in people's lives. He is an extraordinary thing in yeah. people's lives. Mm. And when we go through all this, and when we talk about the gifts, I don't want to be so um, equation-based that we take away God's sovereignty. Mm. Right? So everything I'm about to share with you is within the realm of God's sovereignty. Amen? Mm. Amen. But I want you to know, neither am I uh, just sort of anti any particular thing that I may be sharing with you isn't actually the way of becoming a Christian. And so, here we go. How to receive the Holy Spirit and how can you, and can you lose Him? What is baptism of the Holy Spirit and being full of the Holy Spirit? Let's go. I thought I'd do it this way. I was sitting racking my brain. How do I do this? This is one of the charts, right? This is the big chart you've got. I was racking my brain. How do I explain how to receive the Holy Spirit simply? Well, I could just go through some verses, but I, I want it to be a bit more uh, expansive than that. So I was wrestling with it, and it struck me as I was at the kitchen table. I thought this. <laughs> Let's think about the history of salvation. The history of salvation goes from the left to the right. History, creation and the fall. God made the world. There was the old covenant. The old covenant before Jesus. Then there was Jesus. Then there's the new covenant. Kicks off with the day of Pentecost. Then we've got the first fruits, which is the church age. That's us. Then you've got the new creation and the rise to be with God forever. Balancing out the fall. Balancing out the old creation to the new creation. And we got the day of judgment, and then we got new heaven, new earth. Everyone with me on that so far? Yeah. Yeah. Reasonably, the linear direction. What's the purpose? The purpose, the story begins with creation. Pre-Jesus, preparing the way for Jesus. <laughs> when Jesus was there, to pay for our sins and to show the way. The day of Pentecost, the Alos Paraclete, which we talked about last week, is poured out. The first fruit age, to call and prepare the bride of Christ. That's our mission, is it not? To call and prepare the bride, i.e. the church. Day of judgment, to separate sheep from the goats. I wrestled for ages, what do I say in that box? Mm. For ages I wrestled. Came up with that anyway. Mm. But, and the new heaven and new earth for the bride and God to be together forever. Mm. What are the Bible sections? Roughly speaking, I know they spill out into other areas, but roughly speaking, from left to right, that's the journey of salvation. Roughly speaking, that's the, the, the journey of the scriptures, as they laid out. The role of the Holy Spirit in creation, Holy Spirit is the active force. Pre-Jesus works in creation to prepare the way for Jesus, but he's external, but he's very active. He's moving amongst people, but he's not indwelling in people. What happens next? Well, actually, there's some very interesting verses about what the Holy Spirit's role was with Jesus. And one of the things that he talks about is he vindicates Jesus, or vindicated Jesus. And vindicated means um, sort of uh, establishes him as righteous. It's quite extraordinary, the role of the Holy Spirit in the relationship with Jesus. He drew and empowered a remnant. Out of all of the Israelites at that time, he brought a few to be with Jesus. And he was still external and active. Pentecost fulfills the Old Testament promises, starts to seal people for salvation, which we talked about last week. Starts to enable and empowers God's church, and he also convicts and draws non-Christians, as we talked about last week. Continues the work of Pentecost in our age, in our period now, and then finally... What's amazing, when you get to the Day of Judgment, he actually stops convicting, because that the opportunity for repentance is gone. There's no more convicting to be done, just judgment. And then, he will be there with the Father, Son, perfect relationship, and there's a couple of verses about this Holy Spirit in heaven. So, how are Christians, how are lives mirroring this? Okay, so everyone with me still? Yeah. Cool. So, we are born. <laughs> The story begins. Now, there's, a, there's, there's no clear story about it, scriptures about whether there's a bank of spirits and souls type thing in heaven that get doled out and they're just sort of waiting in the queue. Come on, they do be born. Um, whether they're created at that moment. There's a couple of verses, but nothing very explicit. Bottom line, you get one. What happens in pre-Jesus time? Well, actually, you're drawn. You're prepared to answer the call. You're convicted, you're challenged, you're 
you're given successes, you're given failures, you meet people that quite frankly you didn't have to meet, mm -hmm. but God made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. You had chance conversations. You've been through situations. Some of us have been through extraordinary experiences at the hand of other humans, medically, financially, with our parents, part of God's hand drawing us through the Holy Spirit. Because those things didn't have to happen to you. And the world has no answer to that. But we do. Because we know it's preparing us to hear the message of Jesus. So then somebody somewhere shared the scriptures with you, didn't they? Or maybe you read the scriptures a little bit. And we hear and believe the good news and are convicted of sin. We read the scriptures and we are convicted. Romans 10, verse 9 to 16. Let's have a quick read of that, actually. Just uh, while we're here. Romans 10, verse 9 to 16. Nice. It says... That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth. Oh, so it is with your heart. Uh, yeah. Let me start again. Right. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart. That you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As scriptures say, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can we call on the, the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? Spirit sends us, we preach, people's faith grows, people make the decisions. And then the day of Pentecost equivalent comes, the Holy Spirit is poured out in their life when they are baptised after repentance. <coughs> Repent, be baptised, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit indwelling inside you. We're now sealed in our church time. This is our first fruits, Paul calls us that. And uh, it talks about how we then walk and are enabled by the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to cover off the rest of the talk. Through grace, we're welcomed home on the day of judgment, right? Not through our good deeds, but through the grace of God. He says, not by your righteousness, but by mine, come on home. Good and faithful servant. And then we spend eternity worshipping God in a perfect relationship. So the Holy Spirit... We'll be working in our lives all the time until the point of baptism when he's then working in us, which is a very different dynamic. So, I hope that's clear, guys. Happy to talk it through a bit more. Falling away or wandering away. I've got a lot of verses in your notes around this, okay? So, therefore, the Holy Spirit's in us. We are sealed as a guarantee, the scripture says. Now, here's the thing. It is possible, the scriptures tell us, to fall away, right? It says, therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall, which is a capito, from the, your secure position. So it is possible to fall from a guaranteed secure position. But the question is, how? Because God is also faithful and graceful, is that not correct? So how does this work? Well, there's a verse in 2 Timothy which uses a particular Greek word. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. And there's also James. And James 5 says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, and then he goes on. The point is, it's possible to wander from the truth without falling away. Do you get the point? Yeah. You may even not come to church when you're wandering. You may even not have quiet times when you're wandering. It is possible to wander. It's possible to wander quite significantly. But that's not the same as truly falling away. Now, to go astray, of course, it's the idea of the same word. You know what it says that if somebody should want, if a sheep should wander off? It's like wandering like a sheep is the idea that disciples can do. But... There's also this verse, where the seal actually gets removed. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. It is impossible, impossible. In the, and, and Hebrews 6, 18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. So in the same extent that it is impossible for God to lie, it is impossible for the rest of this verse to happen. Hmm. Wow. 
Do you get how strong that is? Yeah. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the coming age, who have fallen away, different word, to be brought back to repentance, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him. What is the word? It is to fall from a close position. So, there's a difference between a wandering and a true separation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, how do we discern that? The truth is, if you can repent, God will accept you. That's the thing to focus on. God wants everyone to be saved. And we all know people who've wandered. God wants them all back. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. He doesn't want anyone to have fallen from a secure position. Here's a verse that always confused me. 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 to 13 says, Here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we also live with him. I get that. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. I get that. So if I persevere, I'm saved. If we disown him, he will disown, also disown us. If we are faithless, he will, remains faithful. Hang on. The verse before you said, you, If we disown, we'll get disowned. If we're faithful, faithless, you'll be faithful. How does that work? It's the difference in wandering and falling. The words underneath them explain the difference. To disown is to desert because of a challenge. It's the same word used of the person who has shallow roots and the weather comes up and burns them and they fall away. They, they, they separate themselves from God in a deep sense. And therefore he responds to that because he doesn't make us walk with him. If we're faithless, though, that is the word for somebody who's just untrustworthy. Mm. Somebody who makes a mistake, essentially. And God is faithful. Mm. So it's very interesting to see the difference between the two. So the person who, who ever asked me about the Holy Spirit, can he be removed? Yes, he can. Mm. But there's actually only one time in the scriptures where it uses that particular Greek word. There are other instances which I've given you in your notes to stumble, to be repelled and withdrawn and to go off course. But you can look at that another time. All right, so these are all the examples in the scriptures of verses that apply to this. But the key point is, stumble is different from falling away. What about the next bit? Let's talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit. I told you it's stacked today. Lots to think about, I hope, right? What have we got here? Christian's history. We've talked about that already, right? How to become a Christian, how to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the journey we go through. So what happens? In terms of baptism of the Holy Spirit verses, there's only these in the Gospels and in Acts, so Jesus' words, basically, and then there's the words in the letters and the book of Acts. That's it. It's a handful of verses for people to understand, all right? So, in your notes, I've put them all, but I'm going to explain it very, very quickly here, as far as I understand it, all right? I baptise you with water for repentance, but he who comes after me will is more powerful than I, whose sandals are not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So there's a very clear promise. The one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You'll get that. Okay? And then there's a series of other verses. And I'll go to Acts 1, verse 5, where it says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He was talking to his disciples, saying, Don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave anywhere. Go just... Stay where you are, stay together, Holy Spirit's coming. <coughs> Solution to the, all of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit's coming. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you see the nice little bookend there, right? So what you've got is a lot of people are very confused about Holy Spirit baptism because they'll take an Old Covenant verse about Holy Spirit baptism that's pre-Pentecost and use it to say we should be doing it now in the church age. <coughs> They're applying different lenses. So how do we know this? Because let's go to the ones which the disciples wrote down. Okay, so here we go. What I want to, these are disputable, 11, 10, 8 and 2, no uh, not 2, sorry, 11, 8, 8 and 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians is the only time we've got somebody in the letters. So the book of Acts is a transitional period. Does that make sense to you, right? You've got a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things, Samarians coming in, Gentiles coming in, people who are baptized with John but not with Jesus, all this kind of stuff, no idea who the Holy Spirit is. All that kind of stuff's going on in the book of Acts, it's getting sorted out over that 40 year period. But Corinthians He's talking to a church. And what he says is, For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. 
If Holy Spirit baptism was a unique experience for different people, we wouldn't be able to talk in this sense. If Holy Spirit was like to do with the speaking in tongues, which we'll talk about next week, it wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able to use this verse. This verse is saying, we've all been through this. We've all gone through it. The time you get baptized in the Holy Spirit is when you get baptized. Okay? That's what happens. You're circumcised at that point. You are entered into God's kingdom. You are sealed. You are saved. You have your sins taken away. All those great things are going on. However, you've got verses up here. It's a little bit questionable. So here's a couple of points that I would give you. Jesus points to a one-time drenching, a pouring out. The answers to the book of Joel, 120 disciples, physical point of impact, boom, fulfilled. Acts 2.38, 1 Corinthians 12 tells them that there's one point, tells us there's one point where you receive the Holy Spirit and you're being born again. However, there is no second blessing except in the Bible. People try to use that mainly because they take verses from the old covenant stuff into the new covenant and it all gets a bit confused. Happy to talk through that if anyone has any particular questions about that. Here's the one I want us to think about though is, there were times when a transition or specific point had to be made. This is key, right? Because God is sovereign. And I go back to my moment in Bath. Not to say that wasn't the Holy Spirit, but I'll tell you one thing, I was not saved. This is the key point. The key point is not to say, I couldn't be the Holy Spirit. Why not? But, as we all know, there's a great scripture that says, it's very convicting, we did miracles in your name, but yeah, away from me, you evil do us. It's not about the outward signs. They help us and guide us. The question is, are we Christians? So, there's some ideas there. Around that, Jesus prepared them for their role. I love this verse, okay? Um, Luke eleven thirteen. you can read it in your own time. You know it's that verse where it says, keep on praying, keep knocking, your Father in heaven knows, if you're, a good, if you're evil and he'll still give you good gifts. You know that verse? Yeah. The verse at the end of it is the following one. Luke chapter 11. I was blown away by this. I'd always stop one verse too early. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Isn't that amazing? A verse we talk about is just for prayer in life. The context of it was actually praying to be full of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that extraordinary? I stopped one verse too early for about 15 years. <laughs> How many of us stop too early when it comes to the Holy Spirit? God is free to do whatever and however he wants. But when using phrases, we should seek to tie them to the scriptures. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. It's biblical to test. It's biblical to accept, to be wise. Is that making sense, guys? So there you go. Back to the, of the Holy Spirit. So, how long we got left? Not very long. So... Let's get as far as we can, and I'll carry on for the rest next, next week, all right? So we've covered off some of the key questions that we were asked, and just some material there for you to discuss and think about and pray about. And let's talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is really um, our bit in this church age that I, I get most excited about personally. It is a command. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Isn't that awesome? He's like, look, it's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. It's, it's an instruction. Okay? It's very, very clear. I want you to do this. And what he's comparing it to is he's comparing it to the state of the world. He's comparing it, and he's asking us to be wise about how we live our lives. I don't know about you, have you ever got to the end of the day and you just think, I really need a drink? <laughs> Another option would be, I really need chocolate. I really need to just watch a film, <coughs> or the TV, or listen to music, or whatever. Just the kids, keep them away. <sighs> Or whatever it happens to be, right? I'm not saying we were all fallible, we're all weak. That, that's the gig, right? But what he's saying is the world has no answer other than debauchery to escape. But as Christians, we have something far greater. We have something far greater, and that is the option tonight 
even though you've had a busy week, to be filled with the spirit, not with a glass of wine and catching up on the other player. Another word, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord, alright? This is the boiling bit. Zeal, to bubble over, to be hot enough to boil. How many of us are that right now? How many of us are hot enough in Jesus to boil? How many of us are cool? Sophisticated? Learned so much? Cool? Wise? Relatable? A boiling kettle isn't relatable. A boiling kettle makes you know it's boiling. Is that right? If you put your hand in boiling water, what does it do? Sorry, didn't mean to offend. It'll burn. Keep your spiritual fervor. We should be, as disciples, especially many of us who've been disciples for a longer time than some, we should be hotter, more on fire, more boiling over, more full of the Spirit. But my question to you, are you? Brothers, as you lead your families, as you lead your wives, are you hotter than your family? Because I'll tell you what, they will cool down to you. That's a law of life. Come to Chris anyway. <laughs> Bubbling over, it's a command, not an option. What is it? Well, the thing I love about Ephesians chapter 5, and we're probably going to finish there, but have a look at Ephesians chapter 5, which is where we got that verse. So I want to just, you to scan it with me as we go through it. See, what he says is, look, don't turn to the world, don't turn to anything else but the Spirit of God and a relationship with God, because I'll tell you what, you know, it's great to do sport, but it's better to have a phenomenal relationship with God. It's great to chill out, but it's better to have a phenomenal relationship with God. I think sport is the idolatry of the age. Don't you know, know that? Yeah. I deal with a lot of people at work, and <laughs> again and again, the, the question is, how much light grew you got, how expensive are your bike? <laughs> nothing wrong with riding your bikes, it's awesome, nothing wrong with swimming, nothing wrong with anything else you want to do. But are you hotter for God than you are for your bike? Mm. Or for any other hobby, or fashion, or anything else you want to think about? Yeah. So, if you are, this is what happens. Ephesians chapter 5, he says this. He says, uh, ba, 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 ba. yes, he says, uh, do not get drunk on wine. This is verse 18, which leads to him, uh, debauchery and said, be filled with the Spirit. And here's interesting, right? Verse 19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I always thought that was a crazy verse. Why is he saying singing three times? You look at the Greek. What he's talking about is the first one is psalms, is singing spiritual songs that are basically scripture to music. The second ver word is hymns, and a hymn is basically taken from the concept of an ode to a great hero. So that's a sort of a spiritual song that you sing that's not actually scripture, but is just worshipping God. And then the third one is just a song, spiritual songs. And the idea there, in terms of the original language, is have you ever just walked down the street singing? You're just singing because you're so happy, you're so inspired. That's being full of the Spirit because you're singing about Jesus. <coughs> so it's three different ways of worshipping God. It then goes on, he says, you'll be grateful. Verse 20, he says, you know, always giving thanks to God. Next one, humility. Submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. The next one, we get strong families when we're full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, right the way down through, talks about how marriage is stronger when we're full of the Spirit. It talks about children being stronger and our relationships with kids when we're in the spirit. Because we have self-control, which is the fruit of the spirit. It talks about healthier cultures. It talks about slavery at that moment. And economics. And how, as a spirit-filled approach, we have to the business world and to our culture today. Fully equipped to deal with spiritual battles in verse 10 to 8. Powerful but not powerless in spiritual prayer. It talks about praying in the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible thing that when we choose to be warm in the spirit, to boil over, where we get to. Mm. So, that's the result of choosing to be full of the spirit. We still haven't got to how, right? There's a whole load of other things that's great <laughs> about the Holy Spirit. One thing I do like is a promise that he'll energize us physically. It's a really great promise. So what does it mean? And we will finish here. He says this, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. In your inner being, 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, basically, that you may be filled to a full measure, the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do measurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Fullness in the Spirit is verse 14 down to verse 19. Amen. What a promise. Amen. What a life. To know all that through God. The full measure of the fullness of God. It's not for super saints alone. It's for everyone. We'll cover that off next week, guys. And maybe take the time between now and the next um, class. Read through the notes. Send me any questions you've got. We're going to talk about how to be filled next week quite quickly. And then we'll get into the spiritual gifts. And then that will take up our extra half of the session uh, for next week. I hope that's helpful to you guys. We'll look forward to speaking to you again soon.